Good morning, good afternoon, good day everyone to this uh, celebration of 40 years since the adoption of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights with a particular emphasis on its uh, contributions to South Africa. We will have some official words of welcome, but let me do some two housekeeping arrangements very briefly. First of all, we, we apologize that uh, today's event is not simultaneously translated into French. However, I point uh, to you that uh, on Friday this week, we will have a conference, uh, 40 years of the Charter, and that event will be simultaneously translated. Um, so you'll allow me to just say that to our uh, colleagues that may be here from the Francophone world. A uh, nos collègues et participants francophones, nos excuses, Aujourd'hui, malheureusement, nous n'avons pas de, euh, des interprétations simultanées. Mais veuillez, s'il vous plaît, nous joindre euh, pour une conférence sur la Charte africaine de droits de l'homme et du peuple, 40 ans, euh, qui aura lieu vendredi 2 juillet. Et cet événement sera interprété avec euh, simultané, inter, simultanément interprétation. Then we also uh, then ask each of our participants who are here, you are most welcome to, in the chat box, insert your comments and questions. We uh, would like to invite you to be as participatory as possible. We uh, would uh, have a session later on during the event where we will uh, obviously pose some of these questions to the speakers and where we will also um, raise maybe some of the comments you made. So, um, yes, so um, then I would just also want to note that, um, unfortunately, we have uh, on our program Advocate Bongani Majola, um, who is the chairperson of the South African Human Rights Commission. Regrettably, um, Advocate Majola had experienced a, a death in the family and is unable to, to join us today. So our thoughts are, are with him and, and, and also with many people out there in our country and the rest of the world who, who are experiencing um, tragic loss and, 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 and um, some bereavements um, at this time. So um, the event today is really linked to the adoption of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. Uh, Sunday, it would be 40 years ago. That was on 27 June 1981. And this event is, uh, as you would see from the program, a collaboration between the Center for Human Rights. Yes, that we um, have the uh, Center for Human Rights at the University of Pretoria, together with um, the Human Rights Institute of uh, South Africa, URISA, and the South African Human Rights Commission. So I ask the um, first speaker then to uh, take us uh, through the welcoming, uh, welcoming words, and that is uh, Advocate uh, Celiso Tipanyane, very briefly about uh, um, him. He is the Chief Executive Officer of the South African Human Rights Commission. He has worked with the South African, U South African Human Rights Commission for many years, some 30 year, 13 years <laughs> before he became uh, the CEO. And um, uh, Celiso had also left his mark in many ways on the human rights landscape in South Africa as a teacher and as a researcher. So uh, we ask you, Celiso, uh, please to direct your words of welcome to the participants. Rights uh, movement people, uh, Professor Pijan and, uh, and everybody else. Uh, it is definitely a, a great pleasure for us as a Human Rights Commission uh, to be part of this event to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the African Charter and also you focusing also on the role of the country as well as the Human Rights Commission. I just want to say very quickly that uh, I hope that uh, when Bani writes uh, his book uh, he will highlight the struggles which the Commission uh, took in order to ensure that South Africa does ratify uh, the African Charter many years ago and we are very grateful for that as well of course the role which Bani played uh, was the chairperson of the Human Rights Commission as a member of the African Commission. But I also want to emphasize, colleagues, that there is definitely a, a, a greater need in our country to support a better African human rights system. And there are still challenges which we have to address the whole issue of the, the involvement of South Africa in the African court, as well as the lack of a tribunal inside that, which would also speak to human rights issues. 
So I think uh, this uh, anniversary does call for a deeper reflection on us as a country, as individuals and institutions as to how we can strengthen African human rights system, which was basically uh, you know, brought into place through the adoption of the chapter 40 years ago. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Talisa, for that uh, welcome on behalf of the South African Human Rights Commission. We now turn to Professor Tawana Kupe, who is the Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of Pretoria. He served in managerial, uh, managerial positions um, prior to taking his position at UP in January 2019 with the University of the Witwatersrand and with Rhodes. His uh, subject fields are English language and literature, media studies, journalism. And I can sincerely say that since Professor, Professor Coupe arrived at the University of Pretoria, he found many opportunities to make uh, the University of Pretoria really an African global university. And some people say that future Africa really has become his second home. Professor Coupe, thank you for joining us. And please, we listen to your words of welcome to the participants. Thank you, Professor Vigan. Good day and welcome all participants to this historic event. I acknowledge in particular, Judge Bernard Ngope, the tax ombud. He might actually be stuck in the other connection. So Prof. William, you might want to send a message to him. Professor Banyi Pichiana, seasoned human rights lawyer, theologian and educator, advocate Pastin Takula, information regulator of South Africa, Advocate Dumisa Nzeweza, newly elected judge of the African Court on Human and People's Rights. Advocate Zeliso Tipanyane, Chief Executive Officer, South African Human Rights Commission. Ms. Colette Lothojane, Executive Director, Human Rights Institute of South Africa, popularly known as URISA. Ms. Karun Homo, Director, Gender and Diversity Management, Department of International Relations and Cooperation. I'm honored to welcome you all to this celebration of 40 years of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights with a focus on South Africa's contribution. The aim of the event is to celebrate the adoption of the African Charter on 27 June 1981, which was 40 years ago this past Sunday, and to reflect on the contributions of South Africa and South Africans to the African Charter and its application and implementation. This event is the result of a partnership between the Center for Human Rights, Faculty of Law, University of Pretoria, JURISA, and the South African Human Rights Commission. The Center and JURISA enjoy observer status, and the South African Human Rights Commission has affiliate status with the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. The commission was established in 1987 to monitor states' implementation of the African Charter. It was from 2000 and six, complemented by the African Court. The work of the University of Pretoria Center for Human Rights generally and at this event specifically are closely aligned to the university's commitment to be a leading research uni intensive university in Africa, recognized for the impact it makes. By presenting postgraduate programs and conducting cutting edge research on human rights in Africa, the center invests in the Africa we want, the, as the African Union Agenda 2063 proclaims. The event is broadcast from UP's Future Africa Institute and Campus, a continental transdisciplinary research hub. While we are due to, due to the pressing present circumstances not able to, to gather and be together in person, we anticipate receiving many of you at Future Africa in the not too distant future. Let me add here that you'll be following on great steps. And Judge, uh, the former Chief Deputy Chief Justice Tihang Moseneke launched his book, All Rise, from this very facility. Today, we pay, we, we, we pay and recognize that the, the legal framework for the promotion and protection of human rights on the African continent that we celebrate today has been put in place by African leaders. We meet as one, President Kenneth Kaunda, one of the last of these founding fathers, and an apologist for African human, humanism has just passed away. We remember him fondly 
together with such African leaders as President Julius Nyerere, Mwalimo, Leopold Seda Senghor, and Daouda Jawara, who were pivotal in bringing the drafting process of the Charter to a successful end. But today, we also honor South Africans who each has in their own right made or is about to make a telling contribution to ensure that the Charter's lofty ideas were given practical application. Professor Pichiana and Advocate Lakula served as members of the African Commission. They are both giants on the South African legal landscape who brought their pan-Africanist idealism to the African Commission. We remember the trade-brazing role of Judge Mwope, who was in 2006 elected as one of the first judges of the African Court. We take this opportunity to congratulate Judge Steveza for his recent election to the African Court and wish him well for his six-year term. And we recognize Ms. Karun Hop, who was seconded by the South African government to the Commission Secretariat in Banjul for her labor of love in advancing women's rights within the Commission's work. I will leave it to our guests of honor to do the rest of the talking. I trust that this event will not only look at the past, but also chart pathways to a future in which the values and ideals set out in the African Charter are increasingly being realized. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Coupe, for those welcoming words <clears throat> and also further contextualizing the event. We now turn to the third partner, <clears throat> Hurisa, and specifically the executive director, Ms. Colette Letluyane. Uh, she has really been a stalwart of human rights activism in South Africa and in the African continent more broadly. She's been working as a human rights defender for longer than 20 years. And uh, she has left a mark, for example, on uh, getting civil society organized within the NGO forum that had played such an important part also within the African Commission's work. Colette, thank you so much for working with us on this event. We turn to you now to give your word of welcome, but also to further elaborate on the context of this event. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Good morning, everybody. I wish to acknowledge this protocol. Professor Tawana Kupe, Professor uh, Bani Pichana, Justice Ntsebeza, Advocate at Sidiso Tipanyani, Mrs. Karen Komu, all protocol duly observed. Professor, it is really a privilege to have Eurisa as a partner with the Center for Human Rights. And we are also grateful for this collaboration with the South Africa Human Rights Commission. This collaboration has existed for many years in promoting the African systems of human rights in South Africa and on the African continent. Today, we are joining hands together as partners to applaud the collective role played by the founding fathers of, of the African Union, formerly the Organization of African Unity, the OAU, to secure a regional human rights instrument for protecting people's rights on the continent. The regional instrument has made laudable developments in shaping the human rights trajectory of the African continent. These developments began taking shape with the inauguration of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights on 2 November 1987. This was after the African Charter had entered into force on 21 October 1986. This day, 21 October, is celebrated annually as Africa Human Rights Day. Having worked closely with the African Commission, my remarks are focused mostly at the Commission's work. By that time, South Africa was still under apartheid. It was only after 1994 that South Africa started playing a constructive role in advancing human rights on the continent. It acceded to the African Charter in 1996. Professor Bani Pichana was nominated as a member of the African Commission in 1997. 
Civil society saw this as an avenue to advocate for the African human rights system in South Africa and the region. They gain invaluable expertise, participating in commissions processes, promoting the African Charter. Professor Pichana facilitated NGO involvement by encouraging civil society dialogues to take place before and after sessions of the commission. These dialogues grew and extended and encouraged CSO networks in Southern Africa more broadly to participate in commission sessions. These networks contributed to the work of the Commission to Protect Human Rights in Africa, including through their involvement in the Grand Bay Declaration. However, it took the Commission over a decade since its establishment to formalize the involvement of civil society as key partner in promoting human rights. South Africa subsequently also nominated Advocate Pensi Klakula as a member of the African Commission. The era of Advocate Klakula was dominated by her role as a special rapporteur on freedom of expression and access to information in Africa. She was able to present a unique atmosphere for civil society within and, within and outside South Africa to promote freedom of expression and access to information in Africa. At this time, the interaction between civil society and key government officials like DERCO, Department of Justice and Constitutional Development, Department of Women, supported the domestic implementation of the African Charter in South Africa. Advocate Lakula was elected as chairperson of the African Commission in 2015. She was also prominent in promoting the granting of observer status to NGOs working on sexual orientation and gender identity, including sexual minority groups in Africa. South Africa also contributed positively in seconding Mrs. Karen Homo to provide technical support to the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Women in Africa and to support the African Commission Secretariat. During her time, Mrs. Homo engaged in an overhaul of the Secretariat system for registration of human rights statements by state parties, national human rights institutions, and NGOs, which improved interaction with the African Commission during public session. The Commission played an important role in the adoption of a protocol establishing the African Court on Human and People's Rights in 1998. The protocol only entered into force in 2004, and the court came into being in 2006. It should be noted that progress in ensuring effective protection of rights by the court has been thwarted by state reluctance to grant citizens direct access to the court under Article 34.6 of the protocol. Judge Barnett Mwepe was elected as one of the first 11 judges on the court and served until 2014 and been appointed as deputy president of the African court. We are reminded that Justice Mwepe promoted the advocacy for South African citizens' access to the African court, particularly during African Commission session held in Angola in 2014. The attendance of Justice Mwepe concluded with the Commission's adoption of Resolution 275, promoting the protection of sexual orientation and gender identity people from discrimination and violence. Now we come to the success of the African Charter. The African Charter explicitly provided opportunity for the people to debate human rights problems facing the region, as well as providing a space for contributing solutions for addressing Africa human rights problems. The Commission accelerated the protection of human rights in the continent by developing normative standards, soft law, guidelines, and research studies. It also built up a wealth of African jurisprudence in response to the communication submitted to it. The Commission further ensured protection of vulnerable groups, including women, refugees, children, indigenous populations, sexual and gender minorities, people living with HIV AIDS, persons with albinism, persons with disabilities, and older persons. It also adopted resolution advocating for democracy, freedom of expression, information, association, assembly, 
peace and natural resources. Challenges that the Commission faces, uh, uh, the African, faced by the African Charter. The Commission is established to promote and protect human rights impartially, independently, without fear and favor in the region. However, the Commission's mandate was interfered by the AU Executive Council when instructed the Commission in 2015 to withdraw the, obs the observer status of a CSO promoting women and sexual minority rights. Although the Commission reiterated its oversight independence over African Charter and still has reference to Resolution 275, the observer status of a CSO working on LGBTI rights remains withdrawn. The Executive Council even went further by requiring an amendment of criteria for granting and maintaining observer status for NGOs working on human rights and people's rights in Africa. In response to this, the Commission adopted Resolution 361 in 2016. The lack of implementation by states of the decisions of the court and the recommendations of the Commission remains a challenge. Concluding observations passed by the Commission recommending reforms are often not implemented. Direct access to the African court also remains a challenge. The Commission has also not been made full use of uh, referring cases to the African court. In my conclusion, Prof, <coughs> let me say that by noting that states, parties to the Charter have to submit periodic reports every two years highlighting progress made legislatively and administratively to advance human rights at the national level. Although South Africa had submitted two previous reports, it now has an outstanding periodic report. The concluding observations the Commission issued in 2016 have largely not been implemented, including that recommendation that South Africa should make an Article 34.6 declaration accepting direct access to the court. We congratulate Advocate Justice Tumisa Butle Ntsebesa, who is the senior counsel in South Africa, newly appointed judge of the African Court, and we are looking forward to working with you on these significant human rights instruments to strengthen work of these regional human rights bodies in South Africa and across the continent. I thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Colette, for those uh, contextualizing and uh, thank you words. We are guided by those remarks. Now we get to the real uh, meat of today's uh, event. We are looking at uh, the five extraordinary South Africans that are our guests of honor who have each contributed to the work of the African human rights system. I should pause to say that there may be others, and there are others, uh, in addition to these five, uh, whose involvement perhaps is still a work in progress. I'm thinking here of the current acting executive secretary of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, Ms. Lindiwe Kumalo, who clearly is also a South African and is in the process of leaving her uh, footprints also on the African human rights landscape. Permit me pleased to say a few words just about the Commission and the Centre's involvement with the Commission. We've been privileged as a Centre for Human Rights over the years um, as uh, enjoying observer status with the Commission to work in various ways with the African Commission. One of these ways had been to uh, prepare a publication, a concise, informative, yet accessible publication or booklet on the African human rights system. And we thought it uh, opportune today to launch a revised and updated version of that publication, a guide to the African human rights system uh, in commemoration of the 40 years of the African uh, Charter uh, today. So uh, we hope that this will be useful to you. I think uh, the details of that will also be displayed in the chat. So that is the guide on the African human rights system that hopefully will be useful to each of us. But let me turn to the first of our commissioners, that is Commissioner Barney Petiana. Where to start to introduce uh, uh, Professor Petiana? I think he's a, he's a pan-Africanist 
uh, in word and deed. He's been the uh, chairperson of the South African Human Rights Commission. He has been the first black person to be appointed as the vice chancellor and principal of the University of South Africa, serving from 2001 to 2010. But as far as the commission is concerned, he served there from 2007 to 2003 for one term. Personally, I am in admiration of his work, particularly around indigenous people's rights. He was one of the people first in the commission to recognize the plight, the importance of securing also uh, the rights of indigenous peoples in Africa and uh, contextualizing and conceptualizing the concept. So uh, we have a short video that we will play to further introduce uh, Professor Petiana. And Professor Petiana, please, at the end of this video, we ask you to please take the virtual floor for your remarks. At that time, um, the state law advises that in advising government against um, ratifying the, uh, uh, the protocol of the African Court of Human and Human Rights. It seemed to us to be a very strange position for the state law advisors to take. And, and the predominant thing, and this is the idea today, that was a concern for them, was that we have a constitutional court and um, the manner in which the constitutional court rules and operates should be sufficient to obviate any problems and challenges that citizens would have. Good morning, friends, and uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> for the invitation to participate in this event to mark 40 years of the, African, of the adoption of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. Um, uh, a particular uh, uh, gratitude to Professor Franz Fillion and the uh, Center for Human Rights at the University of, uh, of Pretoria, a pioneer in, uh, in human rights work and research uh, at universities in South Africa. I also wish to, to, to thank the South African Human Rights Commission, uh, Advocate Bongani Majola and uh, Advocate uh, <clears throat> Sidiso Tipanyane, uh, both friends and colleagues who uh, have participated in this and indeed have advanced the work of human rights in South Africa and the partnership with the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. To my good friend, uh, Colette Litwaniana, um, <clears throat> the CEO of the uh, uh, of HURISA, Human Rights in Africa, um, for the invitation and for really working together to put this thing together. To all of you and others who participated, I, mean, I am eternally grateful. Lovely to see my other uh, uh, colleagues and good friends uh, participating in this. Uh, Advocate Pensi Kakula, together we were in the first tranche of human rights commissioners uh, uh, in 19, uh, when was it, Pensi? 1995. Um, and I'm also delighted to have uh, my chancellor, um, Judge uh, Bernard Wepe. Um, who for me will always be chancellor because he was our chancellor at, uh, at UNISA for very many years, as well as um, my other good friend and colleague, um, uh, Dumis San Cereza, uh, who is now a judge in the African Court on Human and People's Rights. Delighted to be here. I have uh, been advised that I have uh, exactly no more than 10 minutes uh, to do this uh, talk and um, a typical of Franz Fillion's style and he's set out exactly what I'm supposed to be saying and, uh, and how much time it must be done and uh, I, shall, I shall duly oblige. I've got really basically three points to make, like a good preacher. <clears throat> the first one is to say 
briefly on, it was a great honor for me to be invited to serve in the African Commission. It was a, a, a huge privilege um, to be asked to represent South Africa by then Minister of Justice, uh, Dalla Omar. Um, and, and getting to uh, Banjul for my first session um, was a, just a, a tingling sensation and excitement that I felt um, to be in the, in, the, in the presence of some of these great African human rights lawyers um, who really wanted to make a difference in the continent at a very, very difficult time. And I can think of the chairperson who was a chief justice of Senegal at the time. And, and he was um, a really committed uh, person, senior person held with much respect. And over the years, uh, Dr. Badawi from Egypt and uh, particularly wonderful uh, Professor uh, uh, Nguema from uh, Gabon and uh, Professor Damkwa. So the quality of the people who were in the commission was truly, truly, truly amazing. And, and it was very good to be in their midst. Yeah, it felt extremely good. The second thing I recall about that is, is that uh, there was a great deal of expectation uh, from civil society organizations, from human rights activists, um, at a particularly difficult time, uh, 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 people really did expect the, the institution established to advance the charter to really do its work. And so, uh, but there was a, a very tense relationship between the human rights organizations and NGOs and the commission uh, itself. In part, it was a sense that the commission wasn't really doing enough to, to push its, its, its role uh, in protecting uh, human rights in Africa. But at the same time, um, there was a sense um, that the, the, the commission in the interpretation of the charter uh, in, its, in its decisions um, could be much more activist in orientation than the commission was inclined to do. And so the, the, the advent or the emergence of a South Africa for the first time in the commission, uh, it's true what France is saying, gave a lot of hope and, and collect, gave a lot of hope to many um, NGO activists, activists, a lot of expectation, partly because they've been quite uh, 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 exhausted and frustrated um, by uh, not so much that the commission was not doing its work, but it was not, it was not going far enough uh, than it should actually do. But to be there with NGOs and uh, uh, in Africa was also uh, a great event uh, for me and, 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 and really appreciated the expectation and the trust at times uh, that people had uh, in the commission. In the work of the commission itself, while I was there, let me just say uh, three more key things. The first thing, um, we, we, we battled a great deal to try to understand what indeed was African beyond um, uh, of the African states. How, how to dynamize the idea of being an African uh, uh, commission, an African charter, uh, for human and people's rights. And, and of course, it was always known in scholarly circles. And in many scholarly circles, it was said that the African Charter was actually very weak. And it was deliberately so, deliberately weakened by the manner in which it was uh, constructed. The idea of the uh, sections of the Charter that were about individual rights, no individual could do that. Then the second one, was about people's rights. And then it had a, a section on duties. Uh, and many people thought there was too much emphasis at times uh, in the idea of duties and very, very limited uh, advancement of the idea of rights. And there was also 
a great deal of trying to 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 advance the rights of the peoples of the communities as an expression of what uh, the charter uh, uh, actually intended rather than was the protection of individual rights so the, the second thing about it it was felt that the charter was weak um, because it, it almost everywhere it, it it seemed to allow derogations and 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 it was felt that the commission itself in its interpretation was 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 um, was hampered um, by its restraint regard for for derogations. The other thing that made the commission in the eyes of many rather weak uh, was the fact that uh, for too much the states didn't seem to be paying attention or honoring their rights and obligations towards the charter. And, and I must say that at the time that I was there, I could see um, the increasing extent to which states were paying attention to the African Commission and its work. And increasingly, states were coming to defend their periodic uh, reports or present and defend their periodic reports. Increasingly, states were sending state delegates um, uh, to the sessions of the of the commission. Increasingly, uh, states were allowing um, uh, 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 commissions and, and commissioners to actually uh, visit their states, whereas before it's something that had become very, very difficult. Then I want to say uh, two things, the achievements of the commission during the time I was there, um, <clears throat> I'll probably mention one or two. The first one, I think, I think we, we managed uh, to move the commission towards a much more progressive and developmental approach in the interpretation of the charter than, it, than had been the case uh, before. Um, made it possible to, to kind of uh, move a little bit away from its defensive uh, approach um, to states and to, to issues like collective rights, for example, um, and, and this defensiveness of the commission, I think we managed on several reports to break, to get the commission to break through that and to accept that the commission had to interpret the charter in as progressive and developmental a manner as possible. I think the second thing that um, uh, I would say was an achievement uh, during the time I was there is to clarify the observer status of NGOs and to establish um, the idea of dialogue and interaction between um, the commission and, 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 and the NGO community that increasingly was beginning to be having a lot more confidence um, in, the, in the commission. And the third um, uh, achievement, I think, is to say that actually um, uh, the, the reports of the commission um, became, uh, I could see that they were becoming a lot, with a lot of content and quality in the reports was, was, was observable and, and easy to see. A lot of attention was being paid to detail and, and the jurisprudence of the commission um, was, I think, uh, a lot more usable. Now, I became a member uh, a bad 10 years or so since the commission was established. The earlier years had been a lot like years of establishing the commission and the earlier days of trying to find out a lot of work was done. So effectively, I would say when I got there, the commission had been really smooth and running as it were, something like six years. Um, so, so my coming there, I have to say, 
uh, was in the early stages of the operationalization uh, of the charter and of the, of the commission. Then I think uh, on this for me um, uh, was a very, very difficult thing because um, there have been, there were a couple of, 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 of decisions that were made which were uh, rejecting the idea of um, a self-determination in, in Africa. In other words, indigenous peoples and indigenous communities could not possibly, because the idea was that everybody in Africa was, was indigenous uh, to Africa. And therefore the commission was, was very, very hostile to the idea um, that there were indigenous peoples in Africa. So we had to work on this uh, together with Evgia to really open up the, the, the commission's um, uh, legal uh, interpretation um, to understand how it was possible for Africans within Africa to be indigenous uh, and what that actually meant. And that led, I think, if I recall, um, to a, 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 a statement or, or, or declaration that was passed towards the end of my time uh, at the commission. So the work of the, uh, and that work actually, uh, and what we did spilled over to the United Nations, um, and that led to the UN declaration uh, on indigenous communities as well. But more importantly for me was that there was a, an acknowledgement by Evgia uh, of the pioneering work that the African Commission managed to do. Finally, uh, uh, I hope I'm still within your time. Uh, finally, let me just say that um, being a South African was a, was, was, a, was, was a great privilege in the Commission. The work I was doing in South Africa, fortunately, I was also chair of the South African Human Rights Commission. I had a, a lot of support um, from my colleagues in the, in the commission. I had a lot of support from the Department of Justice and the minister for the work of the commission. And I had a lot of support from the Department of Foreign Affairs as it was at the time. But more importantly, especially towards the end, at a very, very difficult time uh, on Zimbabwe, uh, um, uh, Minister Gosazana Ramini Zuma was the minister at the time, and and she 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 was having to defend um, the reports that we did at the at the Council of Ministers, I think it's called, and 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 it was possible to actually go and and present the report to her and 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 make sure that she understands what we are doing. And I am very uh, honored that uh, she really, uh, at a very difficult time, stood up for the commission and the reports that we did. And the report that I did, uh, I generally did on Zimbabwe, um, was apparently a very, very difficult one that um, uh, uh, the government of Zimbabwe wouldn't accept. So I think that the uh, relationship we had with the government was a very good one. And also, um, uh, we, we had very, very good meetings during the summit of heads of state and government. Whenever we could go there, uh, President Beke always gave us audience uh, in preparation for the presentation of the report of the, of the, of the African uh, Commission in the Assembly. And so that with a briefing uh, uh, and the needs of the Commission, she was always, he was always sympathetic in listening to how we can strengthen the commission uh, in Africa. And yet, um, uh, there were things that needed to be done that I think were unfinished business uh, in South Africa about the, uh, uh, the work of the, of, the, of the commission. I mean, I, I want to end uh, um, uh, Professor Phil Yoon uh, to say that it was a great privilege for me um, to be a member of the commission. I think I learned a lot. Um, and uh, gave a lot of hope to what the commission uh, could achieve. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Petiana Barney. 
uh, it's wonderful to have an insider's perspective, and uh, I think your your perspective really made history come alive in our in our eyes and ears. So thank you so much for sharing for sharing those thoughts and also pointing to the role of government. Obviously, the Department of Justice and uh, the Department of, of uh, uh, Inter International Relations and Cooperation are quite important role players in uh, maintaining uh, good relations with the African human rights system. Uh, we have uh, their support. Regrettably, uh, none of the relevant ministers and uh, deputy ministers could attend today. But uh, just to acknowledge, as you said, their very important role in, in the broad, broader, broader sense of South Africa and its role within the African human rights system. We turn uh, to another uh, South African of great distinction, uh, a second person who served on the commission, and that is Advocate Pansy Tlakula. I, I'd say she is a South African of great distinction for, for a number of reasons. First of all, as uh, Barney pointed out, she was one of the trailblazing first commissioners uh, on the South African Human Rights Commission. She served as the national director for the Black Lawyers Association. And as I think many of us know, she also was the chief electoral officer and later the chairperson of the South African Electoral Commission. She uh, also now has become the uh, information regulator of South Africa. And she serves on the United Nations Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Uh, but today, the most pertinent point is that she served as a member of the African Commission for the years 2011 to 2017. And for the last two years, she served as the chairperson of that commission. Those were turbulent years, uh, years just following the uh, Executive Council's decision that the African Commission should uh, reverse its granting of observer status to uh, South African NGO the Coalition of African Lesbians. So the clip, uh, Pansy, that we'll see will remind you of that context. And we ask you once uh, we've listened and seen the clip to please again take the virtual floor. Thank you. C'est un virus nouveau qui dit depuis, qui date depuis quelques années pour diviser les Africains, pour les détourner des vrais problèmes qui s'opposent à eux. Commissioner Pence stood up and said that this language is problematic, and I'm calling you, Vice Chair, to order. To the deputy chair of this commission, I heard him use the word virus. These are words that we used, and we know that use words like this, like cockroach and so on, we used in Rwanda and led to genocide. Yo. <laughs> Thank you very much and good morning. Um, I hope you can see me and you can hear me. It's a great honor to be here this morning. Thank you very much uh, to the Center for Human Rights, Curissa and the South African Human Rights Commission for putting this uh, commemorative day together. Let me greet uh, uh, the esteemed uh, panelists who are here, Judge Mwepe, the former uh, President of the African Court, uh, Professor Pichana, who uh, served also on the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. Uh, Advocate uh, Majola, I see you have joined the meeting. Uh, Ms. Colette uh, Letrujani, let me also take this opportunity to congratulate uh, Advocate uh, Dumisa Nzebeza for his uh, successful election to the African Court on Human and People's Rights. This is a, 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 a milestone for, for, for our country. I was a member of the African Commission, actually, Professor Phil Yoon, from 2005 to, 2000, uh, to 2017 for 12 years. I served two 
a six-year terms. And towards the end of my uh, stay at the commission, it felt that uh, I was kind of becoming a commissioner for life. I was uh, ready to, to leave. Um, but it was like Bani said, it was a, a great honor and privilege for me to be afforded the opportunity to serve on the commission and also to be elected as, as its um, a chairperson for the last two years of my tenure at the commission. I spend a whole lot of time, as Colette has uh, indicated, as the special rapporteur on freedom of expression and access to information in Africa. A very difficult mandate at that time, and a, a, a mandate that remains difficult uh, at this point in time, taking into consideration the issues of media freedom on our continent and elsewhere in the world. And I found it to be a very confrontational mandate because there was always confrontation between journalists on one hand, media practitioners and governments and um, media practitioners who continued to experience uh, arbitrary arrest, uh, murder and so on uh, with impunity in their country. So I took over the mandate at that time. And I must say that the situation has not uh, improved a, a lot since then. We have made very little progress in that area. But one of the most successful projects that uh, we undertook was to get the commission to adopt a model law on access to information in Africa after realizing that very few countries on the African continent had adopted access to information laws. And we found that uh, as we know, the right of access to information is a cross-cutting right that uh, enables the enjoyment of other rights. So we thought it was important for our for countries on the continent to adopt access to information laws. So we began then by drafting uh, that uh, access, uh, access to model law on access to information, which countries used to adopt their own national access to information laws. The project was very successful because when we started it, only five countries on the continent had access to information laws. And by the time I left, more than 26 countries had actually adopted access to information laws using the model law. But we had to crisscross the whole continent across the five regions, having consultative meetings on uh, the draft access to info, uh, draft model law. And thereafter, we also assisted with the implementation of, of the law. I think that project was quite successful because I'm looking back, I'm looking back and now as uh, Franz introduced me, I'm a member of the information regulator and tomorrow the information regulator will take over the function of regulating PAIA, the promotion of access to information law from the South African Human Rights Commission. And the work that I, we did on access to information in Africa, I think has come in handy because uh, we were able to establish the African network of information commissioners. And these are commissioners that are responsible for uh, access to information on the African continent. And I, had the privilege of serving as the interim chairperson of that network. I think another important project that uh, we did as uh, in my capacity as the special rapporteur on freedom of expression was to spearhead the drafting of the guidance note on access to information and elections. This is in my view as far as I know the first standard setting document globally on uh, access to information on elections, which guides all stakeholders involved in the, in the electoral process on what information they should proactively disclose to the public in order to enhance the transparency, the freeness and the fairness of the electoral process. In, 2022, in 2012, I think, uh, it was uh, my mandate also sponsored a resolution that was adopted by the commission, which among others requested 
the African Union to declare the 28th of September as the Freedom uh, uh, of Information Day. And this resolution contributed towards the declaration of the 28th of September as the International Day for Universal Access to Information by UNESCO in 2015 and subsequently by the UN General Assembly in 2019. And I think as the chairperson of the human of the commission, one of the most important or difficult functions that I had to perform was to present the activity report of the commission at the, uh, uh, the summits of heads of state and government. And our reports were submitted to the uh, PRC permanent representative council. And I found that one of the most difficult um, functions that I had to execute. Of course, the PRC engaged robustly with the, the, um, the report, the activity report of the commission, but uh, at the same time wanted us or the commission to change its activity report. And I found that I had to to really defend the, the activity report of the commission and stated categorically that the PRC had every right to criticize the activity report, but that they had no right whatsoever to change the contents of uh, the activity report because we felt that doing so went to the heart of the independence of uh, the commission as a treaty body. And I must say that for the two years that I was the chairperson of the commission, I resisted that and I, I really put up a, a, a good fight. And during my tenure, the, report, the activity report of the commission was never changed. And I think uh, what this charter meant uh, to South Africans, I must say that uh, I look back under the leadership of Professor Pichana in 2009, I can't even remember when it was, but just before the World Conference on Racism, which was held in Deben, I think it was 2001, under the leadership of Professor Pichana, who was a member of the commission then, and the late Ambassador Reza Barra, uh, who was the chairperson of the commission, uh, we organized the African preparatory meeting uh, for the World Conference Against Racism. That meeting was held in Dakar, Senegal. I think this was quite important because without the leadership of Professor Pichana, I don't think Africa would have had a meeting to prepare for the World Conference Against Racism. And I think for South Africa as well, another important part that was played by the civil society in South Africa was to lobby the commission to address uh, violations of human rights which were perpetuated against persons on the basis of their real or imputed sexual orientation or gender identity on the African continent. Um, uh, and we know that uh, at that time and now, lesbians uh, were murdered with impunity, that continues. And I think because of the uh, work that a uh, civil society did, the South African civil society, the commission was able to adopt a resolution 275 on um, the, uh, I think the, 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 the resolution is called uh, um, violence and other human rights violations. It's the resolution on addressing violence and other human rights violations perpetuated against persons on the basis of their real or imputed sexual orientation or gender identity. I think this, this was a very, it's a very important resolution that the commission adopted in 2014. And as I am about to finish, I see that my time is over. Uh, what uh, the future of the charter in South Africa? I think my, I was pleased actually in 2019 to read the judgment of the Con Constitutional Court in the case of New Nation Movement versus the President of South Africa. And this case was brought by the New Nations Movement uh, on the 
uh, challenging the Electoral Act to the extent that it did not allow independent candidates to, content, to contest national and provincial elections. And uh, I think we are all um, aware of that case. But when I read the, that uh, judgment, I was quite pleased that uh, the African, uh, the, our constitutional court quoted with approval a decision that was made by the African Court on Human and People's Rights in the case of Tanganyika Law Society versus the United Republic of Tanzania on the interpretation of Article 10 of the African Charter. I think our courts, I think, uh, should uh, continue or, uh, in fact, increase the reference to the um, jurisprudence of the African Court on Human and People's Rights and the jurisprudence that um, came out of uh, the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. So I think this was quite uh, refreshing to, to, to read uh, that judgment and how the court referred to the jurisprudence of the African Court on Human and People's Rights. Finally, I think um, it will be good for our government also to commemorate days such as this. I mean, the charter is 40 years uh, or 10, 40 years on, on Sunday. And there is absolute silence, deafening silence uh, in our country as far as the celebration of this important day is concerned. And maybe one of the recommendations to, that should come out of this is that maybe parliament in future should uh, consider commemorate, commemorating this uh, day because that will then enhance uh, the visibility and the understanding of the, the charter in South Africa. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Advocate Lakula. Um, again, sharing your insider's perspective, but also uh, reminding us that sometimes it is necessary to fight the good fight. And certainly, yes, two terms, 2005, uh, and uh, to the end of 12 years, you've really contributed immensely. And thank you for pointing out to these concrete uh, instances of how the African Charter and the Commission's work have been instrumental in really affecting people's actual lives. Let us then now turn to uh, the African Court on Human and People's Rights. As I think Colette earlier indicated, the court started functioning in 2006. So 2021 20, also marks a 15 years milestone uh, of the functioning, the operationalization of the African court. So we are very pleased also to invite another exceptional jurist, a jurist of great standing in South Africa, to uh, address us briefly about his insights. That is uh, Judge Nguepe, Bernard Nguepe. Uh, he is presently heading the Office of the Tax Ombud in South Africa. But previously, as I think most South Africans would know, he served for many years um, as a judge of the High Court of South Africa, 18 years in total, 14 years of those he served as judge president of the North and South Gauteng High Courts. He also acted for periods of time with the South African Constitutional Court and the Supreme Court of Appeal. His term with the African Court on Human and People's Rights was from 2006 until 2014. He was elected initially by the drawing of lots for a two-year term, and then his term was extended by another six. Uh, again, an illustration of a trailblazer. Uh, Judge Mwepe then was part of the first group of African Court judges. In the clip that follows, I think the emphasis is placed also on his contribution to the jurisprudence of this court through his separate or minority opinions. Thank you very much for honoring us with your presence, Judge Mwepe. After listening to the clip, we invite you to take the floor and share your remarks with us. I regard as the high point of the court's work thus far the minority judgments that Justice Mwepe authored and alluded to, and out of respect and honor, um, the place of minority judgments should be in, 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 enhanced. Um, 
Some courts do not have the right to write minority judgments. Some courts do not like doing so. Some courts like to speak in the voice of the court only. Right from the start and from those first judgments. People always think that you come to court on contentious matters. But you can also approach this court for an advice, an advisory opinion. Because a country may, for example, set up its own constitution and then before putting it into operation, they can approach our court to find out whether the provisions of their constitution relating to issues of human rights are compatible with the African Union's Charter on Human Rights. And then we'll advise them. And if they take our advice, if we feel that their constitution is going to be in conflict with the Charter, then they would redraft it in such a way that it would not be in conflict. Uh, th thank you uh, for, the, for, for the invite. That clip must be uh, quite old because I still had a lot of hair then. Um, I must apologize for joining you late because I didn't realize until it was late um, that you have moved um, from that particular platform to this one. Um, yes, thank you for for this invite and I'm pleased to see uh, these distinguished members of the panel whom I've known for a very long time. Uh, Professor Pijani has just said that he would always refer to me as the chancellor. He also knows that once he gets a call and somebody on the, on the other end says, Mr. Principal, then he knows it's from me because up to now I still call him principal. Um, and uh, Ms. Letrojan, you, you made mention of uh, my participation in Angola with regard to the recognition or rights of the of the LGBT. I don't know, it's such a difficult acronym. It, I always now I get it right. You can't expect a retired mind to remember all the time accurately, such a complicated acronym, LGBT, whatever. And I, I remember being asked to adjudicate between on the one hand, uh, people like that and members of the Ugandan parliament. Uh, there was a huge dispute between them and in the end, the results were, were, were encouraging. Uh, we must wish Dumisa very well in his new appointment. And before I go further, I'm sorry, I've got to say that uh, we are really, really in trouble in this country, perhaps not only in this country, but this pandemic is very serious. In the past 12 days or so, uh, I lost two of my former judges, one of them, my former deputy, and only on Sunday, a third judge well, lost his wife within a few days of the onset of the pandemic on her. And this morning I got a message that one of the distinguished senior counsel, Mr. Price has died of COVID and that two of them, of the distinguished senior counsel, Parkerin and somebody else are fighting for their lives right now in the intensive care unit. So this thing is real, we're really in trouble. We need to look after ourselves, but thanks for the invite. Um, as far as uh, the African court is concerned, uh, let me tell you that one of the things that impressed me, uh, which was a significant moment on the continent was the establishment of the court. Let's leave aside its efficacy. Let's leave, leave aside on whether it has made the necessary impact or not. But to me, as you have heard, uh, the commission, the African commission would time and again sub submit reports. And these reports would not always be implemented and respected. People even loathe the, 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 the reports of the African commission. Now it was the same people who uh, mercifully agreed to have a court which would have which would make binding pronouncements. And to me, that was a huge paradigm shift from people who were reluctant to even implement the recommendations of commission to get into a point where they would accept binding decisions of a court of law. That was a huge paradigm shift. 
And it was a big moment for me. And I do recall the day on which we took uh, the, the oath of office. And I felt to myself, this is a very important step. It may well be that the court is not as effective or as, as it is, but the important thing is that it does exist. And to a certain extent, it has a deterrent effect on the thinking and on the conduct of would-be offenders or perpetrators of, of human rights. Now, it has been mentioned that I was one of the founding uh, judges of that court. And perhaps this also in a way speaks to the connection between South African constitution and the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. I was one of those people who, not because of arrogance of sense of self-importance, but one of those South African judges who felt that such a court should not be started as far as possible without input or participation by a South African judge. Not because we knew better than everyone else, but it was because of the deep head, the injury to our dignity and, and, and the injury to our human rights uh, in this country. We felt that we needed to go there and sh help shape up the jurisprudence of that court lay down the principles for that court with this painful history of ours still in mind to make sure that nothing went wrong with that court. I don't know whether we succeeded, but that was the idea behind that. And, uh, and, and therefore, uh, we tried to breathe into the working of this court, that kind of spirit that would maintain and protect vigorously uh, the human rights. Now, the other thing with the court is that, um, yes, as I've said, we did make some, some pronouncement. We did make some orders. And uh, we can't talk about positive things only. We must talk about the few negatives within this short period of time. The difficulty with that court, uh, perhaps it's witness, but it came with regard to the issue of implementation of the orders or the judgments made by the court. There was no political will on the part of uh, those, uh, the heads of state, uh, to make sure that the orders of the court were properly in, uh, implemented. Yes, it was a momentous occasion when we sat, for example, and made an order against the, the then new Libya because Muammar Gaddafi's son was detained in Tunisia and later on was, before we could pronounce ourselves, he was moved back to Libya. And, but what we managed to do was to issue an order, ordering the Libyan government to make sure that he got uh, medical treatment, he got visits from the close family and so forth and so on. They did not quite honor the, the, the orders uh, uh, as, we, as we had ordered. And we then compiled a report and submitted it to, to the AU, to, to the summit. And uh, at that time, I was the vice president of that court. We, in our report, we indicated very clearly in no uncertain language that Libya had to be taken to task. They defaulted against the order of the court. Uh, Abu Kakule just mentioned something about people pressing for their resolutions to be watered down. That's exactly what, I, what, 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 I, what we experienced. The report, we are forced to water down the report so much that in the end, it really did not mean much. Uh, but that is the weakness of that court. And then of course, um, the, the other issue that we must talk about with regard to, to that is how the, what, what that charter meant to South Africans and that court. Well, as I've said, there's a connection between the, the court our own constitution, and of course the charter that established that court. But our thinking was always that uh, with the passage of time, the jurisprudence of the African court will filter down to national levels. And to that end, when I was still there, we, we, we planned that from time to time, we would bring together chief justices throughout the continent. They should come to the court we would have a workshop and engage on the recent developments and jurisprudence of that court. In fact, what we did was to persuade the AU to recognize as part of the activities, official activities of the court, 
a program in terms of which chief justices throughout the continent would come to the court for a participation and jur jurisprudential discussion so that that prudence will filter down to, um, to, to national levels. We hope by so doing, we would be able to get that kind of jurisprudence to filter down to the uh, national levels. But the problem with South Africa has always been one. I think we suffered too much uh, uh, under isolation. This court, the African court, has never really been popular in this country. Uh, it has never been that much known. And in fact, um, when we came to, there was a time when I quitted that court and I said, I keep on interv interviewing candidates for appointment positions in this court. I've never seen a South African. I've never seen a South African shortlisted here. And the registrar looked at me with a broad smile and said, judge, if you can just help us convince South Africans to apply to positions to this court, we'll be gladly shortlist them if they qualify. I was embarrassed, but not so much because how many people do even know in South Africa that I, want, I once served in that court? How many of them do know that I was even vice president of that court? Not many. I think we need a South Africans in order to get the benefit of this continental jurisprudence and the golden thread of this wonderful charter with all its weaknesses though, to be woven into our own jurisprudence. We need to break out, out of this isolation mode and participate in the projects on the continent. And in this particular case, to engage the court to, to be involved with, with, with its activities. I suspect my time might be coming to an end, but let me talk the, the, to the issue which, fra, which Professor Feljun asked me to, to touch on that, and that is South Africa possibly making the declaration that individual people uh, could take cases to the court, the 34-6 so-called declaration. Uh, yes, I'm not surprised that there is no representation for the Department of Justice or Department of Foreign Affairs, whatever you call it now, because they've not been very enthusi enthusiastic about this particular court. I personally took the trouble to arrange as my other colleagues did in respect of their countries, a delegation of the court, the entire court to visit this country some years ago uh, to meet the head of state. And I must say, we had been visiting heads of state throughout the continent, trying to convince their countries to, to make the declaration. I made that, took the trouble to make that, that, that arrangement for the court to come here which it did. I invited Department of Foreign Affairs at the time. They did not even respond. Minister of Justice did not respond. None of them, none of them even made the travel to come and meet the court's delegation here. What happened was the delegation was at least received by Mr. Sisulu, then as the Speaker uh, of Parliament, and uh, the lady who was, uh, my goodness, the lady who was, is present speaker anyway, my dear sister. But, the government, the official governments never bothered to meet uh, that delegation. So don't hold your breath. The South African government is not about and will not be about to make a declaration in terms of section 34.6. You'll have to work hard, we'll have to work hard, all of us to do that. Um, I think I should stop there, especially because I think I've gone beyond my time. Um, and thank you for the invitation. There are a few more interesting things we have discussed, but maybe they could come up during the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Justice Mwepe. I think uh, what you have actually uh, narrated in your opening remarks, it's just reminiscent of a repetition of what is currently happening. Um, in the um, using the mechanism or understanding or expecting these institutions to be respected, to fulfill their functions without fear and independently. And uh, the government have got duties to popularize um, this 
institutions and the mechanisms. And uh, it's surprising that um, you have been advocating for South Africa to make uh, this declaration, you know, um, acceptable or be signed so that we can have access to the African court. And right now we have actually, we are isolating ourselves because all decisions of our court have to be respected if they are made by the African court. We can't move out of the country. And there are many challenges uh, regarding people that have been served, that have been handed out with decisions that they feel that are not um, acceptable. Uh, I think we need to look at um, new ways, innovative ways of making um, the African Charter, the African Commission, and the African Court more you know, um, effective and holding government accountable to their commitment. I thank you very much for that. I'll now um, introduce one of the champions that I will uh, address as um, very vital in the work of the civil society. Um, South Africa made us proud by nominating, uh, seconding Mrs. Karen Komu. Uh, Mrs. Karen Komu, um, at that time, we, when we saw her arriving at the commission, we thought she was one of the state delegates attending sessions of the commission. That was in 2007, and she has actually arrived to provide technical support to the special rapporteur on the rights of women in Africa, and also to increase the capacity of the African Commission. And uh, we have seen the invaluable work precedent that she has set up in facilitating um, communications and uh, arrangement for civil society to engage with the commission, state parties, and also um, uh, civil so uh, national human rights institutions. Uh, Ms. Komu, she is from uh, Department of International Relations. Uh, she's in the gender and uh, diversity program. And then um, she is now back, she's been back in South Africa since 2011. And I would like her just to give us her own experience and in sharing how the experience she had at uh, the African, serving at the African Commission, engaging with civil society, engaging with national human rights institutions, as well as state parties, what um, info lessons can we learn from there? and then what it is that you, you are recommending as a way forward. Thank you, Ms. Komo. Thank you very much. I hope you can all hear me. And good, uh, it's still good morning. I am going to stand on the already established protocol in greeting everybody who has spoken. And program director, Prof. Franz Felyun, and the co convener, my um, colleague, I salute everybody on the already existing uh, protocol. I'm also taking the opportunity to really salute the fallen and unsung heroines and heroes who succumbed to COVID-19. Um, uh, Judge Mwape indicated that this is really a serious pandemic. 
I'm very grateful that I'm able to address this meeting today, as today is my ninth day uh, being in isolation, having uh, tested positive. I have overcome COVID-19 and I really take this very uh, serious and with humility. Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor for me to address you as we mark the 40 years anniversary of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. The charter, which was adopted by the African, the Organ Organization of African Unity on the 27th June 1980, 81. We simultaneously also mark 35 years anniversary of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights which is an organ of the AU that is mandated and tasked to be the custodian of this um, in instrument. The charter was established to promote and protect human and collective people's rights throughout the continent. The celebration of this landmark instrument for human rights takes place in the significant month of June, when in South Africa, we are celebrating Youth Month under the theme Youth Power Growing South Africa Together in the Period of COVID-19. All activities during this month were recognizing the present and the future role of young people shaping the socioeconomic landscape of the country, reminding us of the youth significant to human rights observance and recognizing also that Africa's outlook is very youthful and we need to harness the demographic dividends of this generation. The commemoration of this 40 years of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights is also taking place during the Pride Month when the nation reflects on the rights of the LGBTQI community. While this is meant to be a time of celebration, it is an important moment to consider the specific needs of the community and how to address them to build a better future. South Africa's legal system leads the way for led the way for marriages, marriage equality and legal protection against discrimination. We are the first country in the world to protect against discrimination based on sexual orientation and the fight for legalize, to legalize same-sex marriages. A lot more needs to be done considering the violation and discrimination experienced by the LGBTQI community in our society. We also commemorate 40 years of the African Charter, six years since the 25th April 2015, when the African Commission on Human and People's Rights granted observer status to a coalition of African lesbians. A lot of the speakers have alluded to that. It was mainly South Africa. South African organizations and the role that advocate Pansi Tagula played that led to this, to this push and acceptance. We saw increased collaboration among international civil society organizations and continental civil society organizations engaging in social, in social movement in support of CALS, in particular extending that to the LGBTQI community and their rights. As we celebrate our, the African Chatham, we need also to be mindful of the fact that the protection of women under Article 18.3 was deemed insufficient. Women's rights activists found that the Charter does not address issues considered central in the African context. These were issues such as female genital mutilation, women's inheritance and reproductive rights forced marriages and combating HIV and AIDS. Therefore, there was a need for additional instrument to specifically address the rights of African women who made up the majority of the African population. Consequently, civil society organizations and non-governmental organization sectors initiated work advocating and calling for the protocol on the rights of women to be established. The process was accelerated by the adoption of a, a resolution in 1999, which appointed the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Women in Africa. 
the protocol on the rights of women in Africa was eventually adopted by the Conference of Heads of States and Government of the African Union during the summit held in Maputo, Mozambique in 2003. This move further gave strength to the human rights system in Africa. The preamble of the protocol reflects that general concern that led to its establishment. It states and reflects on that inadequacy in the African Charter. And it says that despite the ratification of the African Charter on human and people's rights and other international legal instruments by the majority of state parties and their solemn commitment to eliminate all forms of discrimination and harmful practices, women in Africa continue to be victims of discrimination and harmful practices. Because this was the reason why the protocol had to be established to promote these rights and address specific African women's issues. To date, we see 42 African countries that have ratified and acceded to the protocol. The Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Women was given the mandate to promote the protocol and to serve as a focal point for the promotion and protection of the rights of women in Africa. The SARA was further to ensure the general harmonization of national legislation to the rights guaranteed in the protocol. She was to undertake promotional and fact-finding missions in African countries, member state of the African Union, in order to disseminate the human rights instrument for the African Union and to investigate on the situation of women's rights and countries we visited. The protocol was the first regional human rights instrument in Africa to specifically address women's rights, including explicit protection of women's sexual reproductive rights. Another first in the protocol's call was the call for prohibition of harmful practices such as female circumcision or female genital mutilation, which have ravaged the lives of countless young women in Africa. It became the first instrument that adequately closed the gap that was identified as a missing element in the African Charter, thus playing a significant complementary role to the Charter. Now, during my time when I was um, seconded to the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, saving there, South Africa was continued to champion the promotion of the African Charter and the Maputo Protocol through the, its foreign policy implementation. The government of South Africa is always in the forefront supporting the African Union and its organs to ensure that they deliver on their mandate. The significant contribution to the special mechanism on the rights of women in Africa was pursuant to South Africa's foreign policy directive, which is geared towards creating a better South Africa that contributes to a better and safer Africa within the context of a better world. In 2004, the government of South Africa collaborated with the Swedish uh, the Swiss government in strengthening the mandate of the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Women in Africa. This led to both governments deploying technical experts, respectively for a period of four years. And I was chosen to be that expert to represent South Africa and strengthen the special mechanism on the rights of women in Africa. Following this collaboration, the former commissioner, Angela Melo, who was the special rapporteur at the time, was informed of the decision, which she gladly welcomed. The support was both human and financial, as each government offered to cover the financial cost of the second D. Subsequent to this, South Africa identified me and seconded me to the Secretariat of the Commission in 2007 um, to 2011. It was at that time when I met uh, both uh, this program director, Professor, Hen, Professor uh, Felyun and Mekole Dilitrojana. We were champions of civil society. I remember the first time when I met them and we, they were uh, inquiring about their participation in engaging in the running of the commission. The deployment of this resource, uh, which is myself, was actually helpful to the, to the women's rights special mechanism to achieve um, and, and was able to achieve significant impact. 
through the support of the CSO Academia, in particular, the Center for Human Rights and the Human Rights Institution, Institute of Southern Africa, the African Center for Democracy and Human Rights, a number of advocacy, advocacy tools were developed. Those toolkits were, were, were aimed at familiarizing the broader stakeholders, which is uh, members of the civil society and non-governmental organization in the main, with the mandate and the activities of the special mechanism, in particular, the special rapporteur on the rights of women. It was also through South Africa's support to the special mechanism on the rights of women that we were able to develop the guidelines um, the, 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 the guidelines for state reporting under the protocol to the African Charter on Human and People's Rights on the Rights of Women in Africa. I remember when we met um, with Professor Felyun and we had a conversation to say, we have been given this opportunity to really make an impact in the Office of the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Women in Africa. And we need to leave a lasting legacy and uh, Professor Felyun indicated that we have the expertise, which is the young people who are uh, uh, students in, in, in the Center for Human Rights, legal students, and therefore we can bring them together with civil society and experts and draft the guidelines that will assist uh, member states to prepare extensive reports that speak to the rights of women and the implementation of the protocol. And indeed, we were able to develop a booklet which has, was adopted by the commission, which now serve as a guide um, for state parties to report under the, the, the protocol. The center also sponsored interns who were placed at the ACH Vera not only to learn, but provided added technical and expert content to the work of the commission. One cannot also underplay the pressure the commission experienced, which necessitated the development of working method for effective participation of civil society in the sessions of the commission. And I think Colette in, um, Alette alluded to that. There was a time when in the commission, we did not have a proper working method where civil society will engage freely uh, in the deliberations of the, of the, the sessions of the commission. And um, this led to a system being established that afforded civil society ample time to present their issues before the commission session, while at the same time also affording state party representative their rights to reply. Currently, there is a body of knowledge of existing statements that were made in the archives of the commission, which can be accessed at any time. Civil society organizations are able to plan their participation professionally, knowing very well that there's a mechanism that exists for them to engage in the deliberations of the commission. It was through the active participation and involvement of South African civil society and those that were uh, deployed to serve as commissioners in the commission that ensure that South Africa not only adopts domestic, domestic and domesticate each other, but highlighted that its overall implementation is very critical. The work of the African Commission in particular, the African Charter, the Maputo Protocol, and other instruments and special mechanisms remain relevant. Socioeconomic imbalances that are exacerbated by COVID-19 pandemic continue to trample on the human rights of ordinary people. We have to support equal access to the vaccine and demand it as a human right across all sectors. And that is the role that civil society play and continue to play from time that I have learned to work with the commission. The growing gender-based violence and femicide, which are not which now saw the development of national action plans in many countries and national strategies must be aligned in practice to the continental prescripts while civil society ensures they play a watchdog role, compelling member states to adhere and implement those national action plans. Let me conclude by congratulating all the speakers who are selected as a way of tribute to the role they played in shaping the African Human Rights Architect. To Professor Franz and 
Center for Human Rights, Mekolete, the Human Rights Institute of Southern Africa, your support for the work of the Commission and the critical role in strengthening this in instrument is well acknowledged. Congratulations to the African commissioners for ensuring that the work of the ACHPR does not go unnoticed through the progressive decisions that have been taken. There were times that we were always worried that those decisions were going to be overturned as reports were submitted before the African Commission during the AU sessions. However, the determination by commissioners such as uh, Commissioner Pantiklakula, whom I'm quoting because I was there during her time when I was um, serving in the commission, made sure that these decisions were never rolled back. The role that civil society played, led by yourself, Prof, uh, Prof. Franz, and Mekolede, and other, one, other member leadership of the civil society, which, which I'm not mentioning, is very critical and should continue as we celebrate this 40th. I thank you. Thank you very, very much, Karen, for, for sharing that personal histories with us and also drawing links between your own personal experience and the work, the advancement for human rights of the African Commission on Human People's Rights and particularly focusing on women's rights issues where the Commission played a particular uh, and important role. We also thank you, Karen, for, for being with us today um, in your capacity also as um, director at DIRCO, but also, uh, you know, we, we wish you all the best for a full and speedy recovery. And, and we really appreciate your, your honest and candid, uh, you know, personal reflections also about and around COVID-19. So thank you so much for, for being with us and sharing those, those thoughts. Um, it appears that uh, Judge uh, Nsebeza is, is not linked to us. We hope he's not on a different platform, but um, we wish him obviously all the best. Our newly elected judge of the African Court on Human People's Rights, he's starting his term. It should run until 2017. I think he, he doesn't need much introduction. South Africans will recall that President Mandela in 1996 appointed him as one of the commissioners uh, to the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And he serves and has served as an advocate, advocate SC in many important cases in South Africa. So we trust and we anticipate that all of us in civil society and otherwise would have future opportunities to engage with uh, Judge Nsebeza. We wish him all the best. So at this point, we turn to the questions and comments that had been made in the chat box. And uh, we will invite some of our guests of honor perhaps to take the floor again. Now, Judge Nguepe, uh, the issue that has been raised is again, Article 34.6 declaration. So the question is, perhaps you can just give some further insights around uh, strategies or approaches to in the first place, get states that have not yet ratified the court protocol, for example, in Southern Africa, a few states to ratify the protocol. And then how does one go ahead, how does one argue what strategies are there for getting uh, states to make the 34-6 declaration? Judge Nguepe, we would appreciate your reflections on those issues, please. Uh, thank you, Prof. Thanks for the question. I, I guess I can answer both in, uh, in one breath. That is encouraging some states to ratify and also encouraging those who have ratified to make the 34-6 declaration. Um, we, we remember that uh, the 34-6 declaration is the declaration you make in terms of, of which you, you allow private citizens, private persons in your own country to cite you before the African Court, uh, the African Court on Human and People's Rights. What I found to be effective um, is the pressure from civil society. Um, the, there is the coalition. I think the coalition did a lot, a lot of work on the, the coalition on the work of the African Court on Human and People's Rights. And I, I, I think, of course, the, the, the kind of pressure that we can talk about is, of course, uh, uh, peaceful mechanisms to coerce those 
reluctant countries to to ratify and or or make the the declarations i think sometimes we underestimate the power of um, civil society properly harnessed the civil society is a powerful instrument mechanism to to exact pressure on on politicians because really this is a political question it's not a legal question it's a political question Poli it is politicians who must decide whether or not to make the ratification or the declaration the other thing that could work and i raised this one time uh, <clears throat> when i was the vice president of this court and we had a meeting with the rep representatives of the african uh, sorry of the european union and i said to them um you 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 always say you're worried about the issue of human rights on the continent but you 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 always give financial support to individual countries on the continent as also to the african union but what you never do is to properly link as a condition of of financial assistance you don't link that to the issue of human rights and one of the things that you should do is to say to any country to whom you award any uh, assistance financial assistance to say submit an audit of your respect for human rights but in particular coming to 346 i said you need to say to them uh, in order to get continue to get financial assistance from us you need to consider seriously to making the appropriate declaration in terms of 346 i personally raised that issue in addis ababa but of course as i've said these are political questions and them being diplomats in their interaction with various countries they would never do that because they are not in my mind sufficiently concerned about the issue of protection of human rights on the continent and these are the some of the mechanisms that that we can use there may be others but these are some of the mechanisms that i thought we could we could employ thank you very much judge Mwepe. yes so i i, I think there's a small follow-up if i may and that is probing just the argument that uh, South Africa and perhaps other states make, but particularly the South African argument against uh, making the 34-6 declaration, at least at times, had been that we don't really need an African court. It is superfluous to make that declaration because we have a very, very uh, progressive constitutional court in place. Uh, would you uh, give some reflection on the validity of, of that kind of line of argument, please, Judge Mwepe? It's, it's not a valid argument. How then do you explain ratifying the, pro the, 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 uh, the protocol in the first place? Uh, you, you ratify the protocol that enforces the charter. You, 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 you support the system halfway. You don't support it fully. Either the court is relevant or is irrelevant. It can't be half relevant, half irrelevant. So if, if you accept the authority of the court, do so fully, not halfway. You cannot uh, ratify the protocol, accept the authority of the court, but then say, well, when it comes to um, individuals approaching that court, then I am not willing to do that. It is it's not a valid argument. We know what the real reason is. The real reason is that, uh, which has been advanced by some people, is that they are worried that individuals might abuse the system and keep on hauling the country before the, the, the African court. But why would they keep on hauling you before the African court if you, you have a huge respect for human rights? If you don't violate human rights and you have no intention of violating human rights, why, what are you worried about? Why should you worry about? Police catch thieves and not law-abiding citizens. So if you have got a clean mechanism at all to protect human rights effectively, 
and you respect that national mechanism for the protection of human rights, why worry about, why fear about being held before the African Court on Human and People's Rights? That court can never be irrelevant simply because you have got a national effect mechanism because you take a narrow nationalistic view of jurisprudence. Jurisprudence is like a world economy is global of application. You don't find the richness of jurisprudence only within your national mechanisms. Those, the, the court like the African court on the continent enriches your, your national jurisprudence. For example, the, the, there is a judgment uh, that the court handed down with regard to the issue of criminalizing or not criminalizing uh, defamation. I was party to the writing of that judgment. And to a certain extent, earlier I only mentioned about some of my dissenting uh, opinions. There have been quite a few, but one of them, not necessarily dissenting, but one of the, I, I, I was one of those two, three judges who went further to say in so many ways that you must decriminalize uh, defamation, leave it within the sphere of civil law. More or less around that period, there was a judgment in this country, which falls short of what we said in that judgment in the African court. It, so it, was, it, it did not quite uh, declare itself against criminalizing um, a defamation. It didn't go far enough. And it didn't go far enough because uh, it did not match up to the jurisprudence of the African court on human, on human rights. In other words, it was not that much enriched. That is where enrichment comes from. Enrichment comes when you go beyond your borders. Thank you. Maybe I shouldn't go too far about that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Judge Mwepe, for that very, I think, enlightening answer. The, the other issue I want to turn to is um, both, I think, the members of the Commission uh, talked about the political um, interference, if you like, pressure from the African Union policy organ. So the question is, how can the independence of the African Commission and the court be strengthened to ensure that the African Commission discharges its duty as prescribed by the Charter, free from interference from the African Union uh, political or policy organ? So I think we focus here on the Commission, given the particular history around the coalition of African lesbians and NGO observer status. And I ask perhaps per first, uh, Commissioner Pitiana, Professor Pitiana, <laughs> to uh, address this question, and thereafter we will give Advocate Lakula an opportunity. Bonnie, Professor Pitiana, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, it is, it is, of course, we all know it's a matter of political will. Um, <clears throat> and and really, if we take the Constitutive Act of the African Union seriously, um, which 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 does make it clearer than it had ever been the case that there would be uh, uh, instances um, where uh, uh, national sovereignty can be can be overridden in 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 certain in certain cases. Now that, that's innovative um, in international law, um, and and that would then be able to give the Commission. Uh, the, 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 the AU um, Summit of Heads of State and Government, the opportunities in certain instances uh, to address um, extra national uh, questions. But that is a matter of political will. I don't think there is the political will uh, in the continent uh, uh, at the moment. From the African Commission's point of view, we felt at the time, uh, because the protocol of the African Commission um, was designed at the time I was a member of the Commission. From our point of view, we felt that uh, once we, we, we could uh, get agreement on the court and, and, and substantively uh, insert the authority and the power of the court, many of those questions could be answered because it would allow the commission to go to the court um, uh, for a, a mandamus or a declaration or whatever it is um, 
uh, in certain uh, instances. Uh, we really did believe that um, uh, we have an instrument outside of the summit of heads of state that can actually um, have, have the power to do it. Um, it. Beyond that, it seems to me that there's very little that the commission can do because it is a matter of political will. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Pajana. Um, over to you, Advocate Plakula. Yes, thank you very much for that question. As you know, that it's a question that uh, we grappled with during my tenure at the Commission. You'd recall that uh, there was an attempt, there was in fact not an attempt, there was a, an application for an advisory opinion on that very question to the African court. Unfortunately, the African court uh, dismissed the case on, um, on a technicality that uh, the organizations that brought that application had no local standard. But I still think that the question that was the advisory opinion uh, that was uh, sought from the, from the African court can still be sought by the African Commission itself. The question being whether a political organ can actually instruct a treaty body to change its decisions. I think it's an important question. And I think it's a question that I still believe that uh, the African court should assist the whole continent to interpret. But unfortunately, um, just before I could um, advise or recommend to my colleagues that we should bring in that application for an advisory opinion to the African court, my tenure came to an end. So I'm not sure whether this has happened. I have not been closely following the developments at the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Advocate Lakula, for, for sharing that. I, I think, regrettably, we, we are running <clears throat> out of time. We've scheduled a certain period of your precious time. I can just mention some other issues that came up in the, in the chat box, included women's um, rights to land, issues of racial discrimination, and the interesting issue whether there is a South African uh, kind of fingerprint on the work of the Commission uh, and the court. But I think these are issues that we can all ponder on as we keep being involved in the further growth of the African human rights system. So thank you very much for that. We will now take a small break, as it were. We will watch a short video around the history of the African human rights system with a focus on the African Charter. And we ask, please, that you don't go away, because in a sense, the highlight will follow thereafter. We will hand out also our virtual certificates to our guests of honor. So the video will now briefly play. On the 27th of June 2021, it was 40 years since the Assembly of Heads of State and Government of the Organization of African Unity, also known as the OAU, adopted the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. The idea of drafting a document establishing a human rights protection mechanism in Africa was first conceived in the early 1960s at the first Congress of African Jurists held in Lagos, Nigeria in 1961 where the law of Lagos was adopted. It called on African governments to adopt an African treaty on human rights with a court and a commission. However, at the time, African governments did not take serious steps to put this idea into practice. 
When the OAU was established in 1963, its founding treaty, the 1963 OAU Charter, did not impose an explicit obligation on member states to protect the human rights of its people. In spite of the absence of a clear human rights mandate, the OAU took bold steps to advance a number of human rights issues. It supported the right to self-determination with a view to full decolonization in Africa. The OAU also combated racial discrimination exemplified by its crucial role in the struggle against apartheid in South Africa. However, the continental organization ignored the massive human rights abuses perpetuated by some authoritarian African leaders against their own nationals. This was due largely to the OAU's prioritization of socio-economic development and its strict adherence to the principles of territorial integrity, state sovereignty and non-interference in the internal affairs of member states. At the first conference of the Francophone African Jurists held in Dakar, Senegal in 1967, participants again revived the need for regional protection of human rights in Africa. The United Nations also facilitated a series of seminars and conferences in a number of African countries. An ad hoc working group was set up to engage African heads of state on the need for an African regional human rights system. Subsequent to the committee's visit to Senegal, the then president of Senegal, Leopold Sedar Senghor, undertook to table a proposition before the OAU assembly at its next session. In 1979, meeting in Monrovia, Liberia, the Assembly unanimously requested the OAU Secretary General to convene a committee of experts to draft the Regional Human Rights Instrument for Africa, similar to the European and Inter-American Human Rights Conventions. The decision of the OAU Assembly in 1979 to embark on the drafting of the African Charter was Africa's response to human rights abuses of the mid to late 1970s in Uganda, under the then president, President Idi Amin, Equatorial Guinea, and the Central African Empire, under the Emperor Bokasa. When the incumbent heads of state in these three countries all lost power at that time, OAU leaders engaged in self reflection about the OAU's failure to criticize the leaders of these states or intervene in any other. They therefore committed themselves to putting in place the African Charter as a bulwark against the recurrence of such atrocities and as a means to ensure that there would never again be OAU in action in the face of serious human rights violations in its member states. The Committee of Experts prepared an initial draft of the Charter. A conference of 20 African experts presided over by Judge Keba Mbaye was organized in 1979 in Dakar, Senegal. The work of the expert committee was greatly influenced by the opening address of the host president, President Senghor, who enjoined the committee to draw inspiration from African values and tradition, and also to focus on the real needs of Africans, the right to development and the duties of individuals. In the midst of a polarized Africa, with some heads of state accustomed to autocratic practices which would be undermined by a human rights treaty, President Senghor's support was timely in promoting the drafting and eventually the adoption of the African Charter. As a result of the hostility of certain African governments to regional human rights protection in Africa, a conference of plenipotentiaries scheduled for Ethiopia to adopt the draft charter could not take place. Amidst this strained atmosphere, and at the invitation of the OAU Secretary General, the President of the Gambia, President Dauda Jawara, convened two ministerial conferences in Banjul, the Gambia, where the draft charter was completed and subsequently submitted to the OAU Assembly. It is for this historic role of the Gambia that the African Charter is referred to as the Banjul Charter. The adoption of the African Charter on 27th of June 1981 in Nairobi, Kenya, represents a drastic curtailment of the principle of non-interference in domestic affairs. After ratifications by an absolute majority of member states of the OAU, 
The Charter came into force on the 21st of October 1986. While the Charter was adopted 40 years ago, 2021 therefore also marks 35 years since its entry into force. Of all OAU or AU treaties, African Charter is one of the most widely ratified treaties. Today, 54 of the 55 African Union member states are party to the Charter. Only Morocco had not become a party to the African Charter. By the time it withdrew from the OAU in 1984, Morocco had not become a state party. Since its readmission to the AU in 2017, it has not become a party to the Charter, largely due to the contestation of the right to self-determination of the people of the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic, Western Sahara. The African Commission on Human and People's Rights monitors and oversees state implementation of the African Charter. It consists of 11 eminent African human rights experts. The Commission first met on the 2nd of November 1987. Its seat is in Banjul, the Gambia, which was inaugurated on the 12th of June 1989. The African Court Protocol was brought into being to establish an African Court on Human and People's Rights to complement the Commission's protective mandate. It entered into force in 2004. While the Commission's findings are of a recommendatory nature, the Court's decisions are unequivocally legally binding on states. The African Court on Human and People's Rights consists of 11 judges elected from African experts in human rights. The year 2021 marks 15 years since the first judges were elected in 2006 and the court started operating. Today, largely based on the African Charter and its influence within the African continent, human rights has been entrenched as a foundational principle of the African Union Constitutive Act and is central to the African Union. We hope that created some background further to those who are not so familiar. Um, by way of brief concluding remarks, myself and Colette will just have uh, some thoughts and then we will proceed to the handing over virtually of the certificates. I think for me, in the first place, one can say confidently that South Africa contributed to the development of the African human rights system. We've seen and we know that three very eminently qualified, prominent South Africans have served for significant periods of time with both the Commission and the Court and the Judge and Sebeza will do so into the future. The second point for me that becomes very clear is that the um, work and the activities of the African Commission and Court, these are not a, a moment fixed in time. There are important evolutions and developments over time. If we listen to uh, Professor Petiana, for example, there is a reflection on how things started the first decade, the second decade, and there is, I suppose, an expectation that the trend will be progressively, arc will, will bend in favor of justice. But from what we've seen in the last few years, there is a, there's a sense of being disconcerted that in fact the, the trend is not, not necessarily a progressive one. So I think uh, what, we, what we know from our involvement with the system is that, that there is a reason, there is cause for vigilance and civil society clearly needs to work together with and support the commission and the court. The same in a sense applies to South Africa <clears throat> as a government and its involvement. It nominated very good people <clears throat> to serve on these bodies but if we look over time there perhaps had been also ebbs and flows. I actually consulted the activity reports of the Commission and found in the context where Karen comes into play the 24th activity report of the Commission for the years 27 to 078 shows that South Africa donated 270,000 US dollars. Now in, at the time a significant amount of money and South Africa was more invested in the future I think at the outset of the development of the human rights system. It's our cumulative challenge to, to see how can we rekindle that kind of enthusiasm also uh, on the part of the South African government. Colette, over to you for one or two of your concluding reflections, please. Thank you very much. I, I think uh, what I'm taking home is that um, 40 years uh, of uh, adoption of the African Charter um, 
really is a big uh, period of time of uh, delivering uh, political, civil, and economic and cultural rights that are safeguarded in the, in the Charter. And those questions about the impact of the Charter, how has the Charter changed lives of peoples in communities, are very relevant questions. The legacy that is left by our uh, prominent uh, uh, um, you know, brothers and sisters in the continent, I think it's not in vain. I think uh, all of them, they have um, uh, expressed the lack of political will on part of the government to support and uh, to implement decisions of the African Commission. And also um, the power of the civil society, as Justice Mwepe have said, that we should not underestimate that. And as long as you know, we can consider to be properly harnessed, it means we need to revise Re, uh, restructure our, our, structure, our frameworks, our strategies, uh, because we now know where are the stumbling blocks. The stumbling blocks is the charter itself is created in such a way that it limits, um, you know, it does not provide the commission leeway uh, to achieve much. And as a civil society, we need to continue uh, working together, uniting and becoming robust to make the mechanisms of the African Commission effective and work. And as for the um, advisory opinion, as Advocate Pensy has mentioned that, who has got access, you know, who's got lo local standards to approach the African court? It is still uh, give us the impression that the Commission can use its, its mandate to interpret the court, the, the African Charter, in order for us to know that are we having this um, uh, opportunity uh, to re request the African Commission to interpret the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. I, I, I want to, to leave it there with words for all of us, the government, Department of Justice, Department of um, International Relations, your absence here is really missed. We miss an opportunity to engage and uh, to see how we improve in promoting the African Charter in South Africa. And national human rights institutions, we need to find a way of strengthening our collaborations. We do Africa Human Rights Day. That is not enough. Many people still remain unaware of the, the mechanisms. So I hope that uh, we continue doing this work, not only targeting um, um, days like this, celebratory days like this, but um, use opportunities within our powers to make the mechanism effective and realizable. I thank you very much. Very much, uh, Colette, for those concluding remarks as well. Now, we come to the virtual handing over of our certificates. We promise that somehow we will get them physically printed and signed to you. So on this occasion, the 40th a celebration of the date of the adoption of the African Charter on 27 June 1981. We honor, we thank uh, Barney Pajana, first of all, who has worked tirelessly and passionately to advance the promotion and protection of human rights on the African continent when he served as a member of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights from 1997 to 2003. Thank you so much for being with us and receive our gratitude and thanks. Secondly, Advocate Pansi Tlakula, who has worked tirelessly and passionately to advance the promotion and protection of human rights on the African continent when she served as a member of the African Commission. Um, and that was from, to correct myself, 2000 and far, uh, 2000 and f what is it, 2005, yes, to 2017, that is for a term of 12 years with the African Commission. And she served also as a chairperson of that commission for the last stint of 2015 to 2017. Thank you for honoring us with your presence and with being with us here today. We will get it to you personally. Uh, Judge Bernard Mwepe, who has worked tirelessly and passionately to advance the promotion and protection of human rights on the African continent when he served as judge of the African Court on Human and People's Rights from 
2006 to 2014, including as its vice president between 2013 and 2014. Over to Colette to do the other certificate. Thanks. This one uh, certificate is for Mampurani Keron Komu, who worked tirelessly and passionately to advance the promotion and protection of human rights on the African continent when she was seconded by the South African government to serve as an assistant to the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Women in Africa, and provided technical support to the Secretariat of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights between 2007 and 2011. Thank you very much. You will receive the certificate. Karen. Thank, you. Thank you very much, Colette. And my last words, uh, brief words of thanks, sincere thanks to all of you, the participants who listened in, who also thought through the process that we're engaging with today. Thank you for uh, sacrificing, you know, giving your time also to this important topic. Thank you very much to our partners, Urisa Colette, my sister. Thank you very much for working with us so well. Uh, also the South African Human Rights Commission, Philip Mukwena, who was really the man behind the scenes who made it all possible from their side, but also Teliso and Advocate Majola. We thank also very much all the speakers who presented, uh, was represented here, in particular our guests of honor. It was really because you were able to be here that this uh, occasion was endowed with splendor and with much deeper meaning. Thank you so much for doing what you have done and also for being with us uh, today. And lastly, also to the technical people involved, uh, Louis Kluter Productions and all the people that made this seamlessly uh, appear so, so easy to run. But uh, obviously, if something goes well, as they say, it's, it's a team that makes it so. And on our side at the center, also Yolanda Boysen and others who assisted. Thank you to you all. Uh, we will end off again with the playing of the AU anthem. And uh, that will, I hope, inspire us all further to reach out uh, for the stars as far as the evolution of the African human rights system is concerned over the next 40 years and beyond. Thank you.